Welcome, everybody. Uh, welcome to our panel entitled, Are ESG Investments Outperforming uh, During the Pandemic? Uh, we have a really terrific uh, list of speakers. Just to introduce myself, I'm the, the uh, moderator. My name is Mark Zurek. Um, I'm a professor at uh, Columbia Business School. I teach uh, classes uh, in, in capital markets and derivatives. Um, and I guess just one housekeeping uh, feature before we start, just want to mention that the uh, chat feature is turned off uh, and all questions could be submitted through the Zoom Q&A feature and attendees can use the like button to upvote popular uh, panelist questions. Uh, but I don't want to take away any time from our experts. So let me start with Haroon. Uh, Haroon, can you provide an overview of ESG investing and why is it is important to consider ESG assessments? Uh, including that, can you run down on what we've seen historically in ESG investments, the risk benefit and the changing landscape? Uh, sure. So uh, thank you for the invite for this thing. So. Um, as mentioned, my name is Haroon Dogo. I'm an executive director at the uh, Morgan Stanley's Global Stable Finance Group. Uh, so we have a, uh, the group itself sits at the firm level in uh, Morgan, and we work across our different businesses to really help include sustainability into everything that we do, whether that's in wealth management, or I think we have a uh, investing predict that platform, about 34 billion uh, in assets are operating there working with our colleagues in asset management and a range of strategies in private equity or um, active equity or liquidity, as well as across the sell side, whether that's with our banking clients or with our uh, sales and trading clients, where we are working to help them execute on their sustainability objectives through a range of approaches. Um, so what is ESG? Where did all of this come from? What do we really see across the business. You know, it's, um, the, there's not a simple answer to this. Uh, it really is a spectrum of investment approaches that uh, take into account non-financial attributes of the underlying investment. And uh, it really starts with uh, exclusions. This is really the, the bedrock of um, the approach. And there's a hit long history going back uh, all the way to uh, the Quakers in 1898 coming up with an investment framework that excluded uh, alcohol, tobacco, and firearms. Uh, and for probably the next 80 to 90 years, it's been um, really the responsible investment has been a story of exclusions. Are there things that um, the investor themselves uh, feel that are not aligned with their values. And those could be religious, those could be uh, political, those could be environmental preferences. And throughout that period, the number of exclusions that people use uh, really expanded significantly. But from an archetype of creating a portfolio of investment, exclusions have been a pretty significant part of responsible investment, and they still are. The opposite end of that is rather than excluding something that uh, one considers to be a uh, not aligned with their values, is specifically targeting an investment because it provides a, uh, a broader social or environmental public good. That there is a certain level of impact associated with that. Uh, traditionally, this has been the purview of uh, private markets um, and you know some. Classics are affordable housing or uh, financial inclusion uh, type investments. But really what's uh, been changing in recent years is that there is an increasing focus on what, uh, what are companies themselves doing and how aligned are the revenues and the products and the solutions that they are uh, producing with broader um, societal objectives. One popular framework there is the UN Sustainable Development Goals and classifying these activities into those that contribute or detract uh, from the society achieving those goals is one way that we're increasingly seeing um, investors in public markets reporting their impact. And a closely associated strategy that we see 
in this kind of spectrum of ESG approaches is uh, thematic investing, where in the same way where you would be looking at a utter broad mega trend of um, a way that with either the economy is changing or a way that um, social perceptions and therefore valuations are being adjusted. Uh, for example, sort of a non-sustainable version of that would be something like robotics. Uh, there is a range of things under the umbrella of broad sustainability that one can consider as thematic investment. So, uh, climate change, obviously, is probably the largest challenge of our time. Uh, trends surrounding healthy living, uh, issues of inclusive growth, um, you know, some specific things around cir circular economy. There is a lot of things happening and identifying uh, investments that are levered to those objectives is probably another large uh, archetype um, that we see. Uh, and then finally, uh, there is a lot of talk about ESG integration, which is really taking whatever it is that you're doing as an underlying strategy, and then in the process of selecting those investments, uh, including uh, considerations related to environmental, social, or government's performance of the issuer of the security. Um, and those can be, a, that can be actually a wide range of information uh, that is anything from how well is the company run? And the question there becomes, okay, how do you measure that? Uh, and there is um, a wide variety of metrics and frameworks that people do that from order presentation, board independence, uh, assets and, uh, controversies, the social performance of the company. How is the company treating its stakeholders? The, uh, its employees, the communities uh, which it operates. And then finally, environmental issues. How efficient is it in uh, using environmental resources to create um, uh, the revenue that it does, so it's sort of the natural capital. So because it's such a wide spectrum of things, it becomes a very difficult thing to compare apples to apples. Uh, but using third-party data, uh, we've done uh, a little bit of work at the Institute of Sustainable Investing at North Stanley to really look at historical performance. And unsurprisingly, looking at broad categories of equities or fixed income, um, what you see is for ESG integration strategies, which are probably the easiest to compare, the returns you know, can actually not be that big. Uh, returns in any asset class are distribution. And in this situation, you have two distributions overlaid on top of each other, and they're really not statistical. Statistically significant, though, is that the um, ESG funds have tended to have a greater downside protection at a given time, which intuitively makes sense if you think about the information, the added information that um, portfolio managers are using to create those portfolios really is to a large extent risk data. So it is not surprising that the primary benefit historically for broad integration funds has been uh, risk uh, protection. I'll stop that. Thanks, Haroon. I just, Thanks. Just, want, just want to confirm that you've made available the report, which uh, quantifies that, right? But, uh, to your last point about- That is correct. I think it should have been shared in the invite. And it is also available on uh, Morgan Stanley's uh, Institute website. Great. Thanks a lot. Uh, let, let's go to um, Mary Jane. Can you, um, following Haroon's comments, just go through some examples of um, how the how you, your firm integrates ESG into your investment process? Oh, hi. Sure. Can you hear me okay? Um, yes. First of all, thank you very, oh, great. Thank you very much for the invitation to participate in this panel with uh, some uh, very well-known and, and good colleagues here on the panel with us. And apologies that I'm not on live video. I just don't have the Wi-Fi speed uh, to support video on the Zoom right now. And I don't want to cause a crash on the Zoom um, presentation because of me. So I'm just doing audio. So thank you for that. Um, so ESG integration, I guess I'll just give you one minute about ClearBridge. For those of you who aren't as familiar, ClearBridge is a global ex active equity manager. Our headquarters are in New York City and we have offices around the world. Um, we are a firm that's fully committed to ESG integration, so uh, we're committed to 100% of our assets under management to be ESG integrated. And, and the short description of that is 
that in our fundamental analysis um, across all of our stocks, and, and again, we're just an equity manager, uh, we, we run a fundamental analysis as well as an ESG analysis. Uh, we look for uh, the valuation, the risk reward, and an internal ESG rating, among other things. So this means that every investment analyst has gone through the full fundamental due diligence, but also incorporating all the material and relevant factors that are E, S, and G related within every industry and every company. So that's been a, a long commitment. The firm's been involved in ESG for 30 plus years, and it's taken the past decade to try to uh, get it across the entire firm's assets. So we're about 140 billion in assets under management, and um, the analysts uh, spend the, the majority of their time um, on the fundamental analysis and coverage and ESG analysis, but the analysts are the ones who, who lead the engagement. So they are directly meeting with management. They have the opportunity to ask lots of questions and to have updates on management strategic thinking, on cash flow generation, on um, the strength of the balance sheet, on what uh, changes in capital allocation policy management has planned. But in the same uh, meetings and calls, they can also ask about what are the pressing environmental issues that could impact com competitiveness or could um, be an issue uh, longer term uh, relative to their industry and based on changes by regulators, or um, what opportunities they're seeing in terms of energy efficiency and other solutions to help um, increase their competitiveness along as those lines, as well as social issues related to the workforce um, the community, and how they're treating their employees, as well as governance. So how is management uh, structured? Are they overpaying themselves? Do they make good decisions? Um, do they have a good track record? And what sort of, again, capital allocation policies do they have in place? So all of this takes place in every meeting um, in varying forms depending on the topic of the meeting. But what's important about the ESG integration from our view is that it's not just asking about the fundamentals or the short term, but this ESG integration process allows our analysts to really look far out, years ahead, um, to ask questions that you know, may not have an immediate impact in this quarter or the next two quarters, but could have an impact in coming years, like Haroon mentioned climate risk. Um, that's something that um, all of our companies are talking about and our analysts are asking on that specific issue or gender diversity. Um, how are they uh, building up their workforce and um, are they taking advantage of you know, the, the well-documented quantitative analyses around how women can add you know, companies that have high work, workforce with a high number of women in management can ha help to add return on equity as well as lower risk and increase innovation. And there have been a number of studies, including by Morgan Stanley Cellside, um, the Quant team, and uh, many of the other firms have also submitted studies. So um, what we've seen over the years is that this type of approach of analysis, integrating ESG factors into the financial analysis, has not only helped us understand what we own in terms of what are our assets and on behalf of our clients invested in, but also to continually try to help um, push for more change, positive change. We're thinking very long-term view, and an example, which we can talk about later, is what's taking place with um, in the in you know the near-term period that we've gone through with COVID-19, the whole pandemic, and how has that impacted our view and our companies and uh, economic rebounds, and what's taking place, particularly with all stakeholders. So um, I'll take a pause there, and, and happy to answer questions later. Um, but thank you, John. Can you provide insights? Uh, into why investors should consider ESG metrics as part of their uh, strategy. Can ESG help to successfully mitigate risk and why? So, so I'll kind of talk a little conceptually and then maybe a little bit about sort of the stress test that, that, that COVID-19 has provided for the, the field. I think broadly, and Haroon described this well, I think there's a lot of confusion about what ESG is and what it isn't, why people do it and why they don't, right? So screening and exclusions tends to be an investor preference, something people care about and they want to see honor in their portfolio. Impact, well, sometimes it's financially driven based on a belief in an emergent growth theme. Often there's a more specific preference. And, and, and someone asked me the other day, who, who are ESG funds and ESG strategies for? 
And I say, really, it's for anyone who cares about risk-adjusted returns, right, which is pretty much everyone. All ESG says, and I think Haruna and Mary Jane both, both described this well, the world is changing. There are a variety of things that can provide insight. And, and for us, it's really not about E versus S versus G. It's about why does this matter economically? I mean, I think Mark, to your question is sort of why would people do this? The reason you would do this is because it gives you insight into risk, particularly tail risk. It can give you insight into growth, new markets, market change that present opportunity, or efficiency and resilience, which is really about margins, right? It's taking these factors, <clears throat> which may seem broad, but applies them. And, and the reality is, you know, one person's risk is another person's opportunity. You know, 94 out of 100 top consumer packaged goods brands have lost market share in the last four years, often to organic or natural or sustainable alternatives. So that's a growth opportunity for some companies if you understand that trend in people's exposure. And it's a risk for others, right? And so you see these things playing out. So in some ways for us, it's to, to take this from kind of almost an ideological or philosophical place to an investment-minded place in an in analytical place. How can this help me be a better investor? And so the question for us is not, why would you do ESG, right? Any data source, any data point, particularly in a world that's changing that can help us do our jobs as investors better is important or do our jobs running a business better is important. The question is not whether to do it or whether it's a good thing. The question is really executional. It's really how do we do it well, right? So I think that's sort of a little bit of the backdrop. And I think Haroon and MJ talked about that context well. I think a little bit to what are we seeing in terms of this performance? You know, one of the questions over time has been, is this sort of a bull market luxury, right? Is this millennials want something in their 401k? Uh, when good times are good, it'll do well and that upward trajectory will continue. But, but when bad times come, just you wait. Right. And, 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 and people sort of wondered in effect, can ESG take a punch? And, and, and sort of the world got a pretty big punch uh, in, in the first quarter. And, and, and it it's, was a stress test for an awful lot of things, not least of which is ESG. And when we look back to figure out, does, does the hypothesis, the thesis that ESG would wither in a downturn, is that supported by the data? And we look at three things. Number one, performance. Two, flows and three, engagement and focus across the investment spectrum. So in terms of performance, the data so far are pretty inconsistent with the idea that ESG would wither. Morningstar has had some good analyses. You know, 44% of ESG funds were in the top quartile in Q1, 11% were in the bottom quartile. 70% were in the top half, right? 24 out of 26 indices uh, outperformed. I think BlackRock said in their world, 90% of their, indice, their ESG indices outperformed their conventional counterparts. Um, we had a, a long, short ESG basket pair that gained 16% of performance in Q1. What's as important as all those data points is getting to the attribution. Is that a fluke or an artifact of, say, being underweight energy, which certainly had a tumultuous quarter? And I think stripping that out, it had an effect on some of the active management and in some of the indices, but actually the biggest single driver was security selection. That long, short pair I talked about, both of those had no energy weight, right? So security selection played a role. And what we like to say is this is not proof that ESG is magic alpha pixie dust, right? Uh, what this shows is the thesis that it would wither in a downturn does not seem consistent with the data in our real world stress test. Number two, in terms of flows, right? ESG was having constantly accelerating inflows. Um, what was going to happen uh, in a downturn? And I think what we found is actually ESG has continued to have record inflows. And a, a striking statistic for me was, you know, in, in Europe, um, ESG funds had net inflows in the first quarter of 30 billion euros. Non-ESG funds had net outflows of 148 billion euros, right? So, you know, we talked about performance, but where are flows? Where is money going, right? What, what in some ways feels like the flight to safety and the flight to quality, um, it's been interesting to see that behavior show up in flows. And, you know, at a, at a particularly active time in the market, the second week of April, the second highest inflows to any equity ETF on the planet went to a single BlackRock ESG ETF, right? So just flows have actually held up and been quite resilient during this time. And then just focus. I think this is what we've seen. And Bloomberg had a great chart they did at the end of last year that showed accelerating media mentions and focus on this. is why I'm glad I'm doing Zoom because I could do my little, you know, upward pointing arrow. Um, uh, and, and, and then, you know, what we all experienced is there was a moment when people were just focused on dealing with the matter at hand, right? There was so much to navigate. And there was a question of would that, you know, really keen focus return out of the, the kind of height of the pandemic? 
And I think the, you know, Emily Chasen's data in Bloomberg kind of shows what we felt as a business. So the chart through the end of the year went like this, then it went like this, and it's back resuming its upward trajectory. I think that's been our experience. And whether it's corporates at the C-suite, corporate executives talking about decarbonization, talking about their workforce, talking about communities, talking about ESG data, whether it's asset managers, asset owners, across the spectrum, I think we've seen we've gotten restored to the, the, the kind of keen focus in the markets. And so you know, why would someone do this? The reason people would do it is to manage risk and return in a world that's changing, right? It's not, the big question is not, do you do it? It's how do you do it well? And then number two, you know, how is it held up in its, in its you know, frankly, its first significant real world stress test, I'd say kind of so far so good. Okay. Thank you, John. Uh, back to uh, Mary Jane. Uh, uh, do you have any insights we'd like to give the, share with the audience insights on what it means to be a responsible company and investment manager today? Um, so, so uh, well, I guess it's kind of like two parties. It's, it's the investment manager who um, takes the capital and decides to invest in other companies in the form of stocks. So to be a responsible investment manager, um, I think there are a variety of ways it's within financial services, investment management, that is. And so you think of typically um, a big focus on your employees or your workforce and um, productivity and intellectual capital and experience. And those are things that are typically important within investment management firms, but you want to make sure that your employees are taken care of and that they feel um, they're supported by management in the activities that they need to carry out uh, in terms of um, trying to manage the portfolios as best as they can for their clients. But on the company side of or the corporates where we may invest in, um, you know, I think we have to always remember uh, that we are looking for companies with very strong balance sheets, with um, a very attractive uh, valuation and time of entry, as well as um, company managements that are, you know, very strong in execution and have a very good strategy in place. So. In addition to that, I think, you know, our experience has been that companies that have really been attuned within their industry. So, um, you know, materials companies, which will know what are the key ESG issues that they may face either today or in the next 10, 15 years, that how attuned are they to where they can continue to improve or where they can try to um, fix areas that they, they need to improve. If we think of companies in the food industry, you know, how are they moving into the next generation? Are they thinking about issues around plastics and plastic packaging, or are they thinking about livestock and um, antibiotic use? Are they thinking about plant-based options or um, health and wellness, uh, organic versus and natural? Uh, so. What we're looking for is companies within each of their industry, whether it's a food company or whether it's a retailer, very heavy on hourly workers and, and the retail presence, um, or whether it's a bank and their um, lending practices, whichever industry it might be, uh, we want the company again to be financially sound and a compelling investment, but we also want them to be um, one of the best actors in their industry on each of the fronts that we described just now um, that are most relevant to their industry. Thank you. Maybe we could shift a little toward, to more focused questions on, on COVID. So maybe we'll start with Haroon. Um, how are things from COVID affecting ESG factors? For example, healthy living, climate, sustainable lifestyle. So um, I think uh, John's talked a little bit about um, what uh, the stress test that um, the uh, that happened to everybody at the end of February and beginning of March, and um, you know, these are large beta moves in the market. And I think I'd sort of split this in in two halves I, and kind of the um, the different roles that we play in the capital markets. On one hand, I think on the banking side. Um, there's a way that the ESG investors have been looking for opportunities to support recovery in response to this. And uh, you know, some of the issuances that the firm has been associated with, whether that's uh, raising equity for whether or not to help with vaccine development, whether that is uh, working with uh, Pfizer on their national in, um, 
initial sustainability bond, which is um, levered to the work that they're uh, similarly doing uh, in response to COVID or with some of the um, development banks or, um, for example, CDP in Italy and financing the response. I think it's important to remember that these pools of uh, responsible investment capital have actually stepped up and we've seen significant interest. Um, I think uh, the CDP issuance was 38, 40% SRI capital uh, that actually went and supported those um, intentional activities. So I think, you know, outside of the markets, which uh, have their own dynamic, um, these pools of capital have actually actively looked for these opportunities uh, and invested in them. I think the firm has been uh, fortunate to be able to support um, those activities and help make those connections. Um, so I said, uh, John talked a little bit about uh, how the market operated. Uh, the, uh, it's not surprising, I think, as a whole that the funds, uh, as a large beta move, everybody went down. Uh, the question is, amongst that, how did things behave in equities and fixed income? And in a, you know, if you apply a similar methodology to what we had done with the historical analysis, just looking at quarter one, right. uh, you would see that uh, sustainable investments uh, did reasonably well, uh, probably did 2% uh, better than their um, traditional counterparts. Now the part of the question becomes why? And when you look at a, a sustainable equity fund, uh, they certainly have certain style preferences. They have a preference for larger companies. They have a preference for uh, lower capital intensity companies. Um, and they have preferences for certain sectors, I think, uh, what John um, highlighted. And a lot of that can explain uh, some of that difference. And we certainly see that with a lot of our own uh, ESG funds, whether the, those that are ESG aware in our active um, equity platform or those that are explicitly targeted towards sustainability. Uh, they have stylistic differences uh, from the index, uh, but they've also done really well. They've uh, been able to beat uh, their benchmarks consistently. The question becomes one of attribution. Um, you know, and it can be a little bit academic to get to the, what is the exact component of sustainability right. in ESG? But one thing I'd point out is, uh, for example, if you think of a uh, something that you can isolate as a factor that seems to be pretty consistent across different frameworks is something like carbon intensity. And uh, we had been working with a number of uh, our clients around that idea. And if you were to create such a factor that's market sector uh, neutral uh, and neutralized for all the other factors, you would actually see that it has had a, uh, a meaningful uh, uptick, not just in the past couple of years, but also throughout the crisis. Obviously, there's quite a bit of volatility, but it is up a um, you know, percent and a half for a year, which for something that is so fully neutralized is actually uh, meaningful uh, in this situation. So uh, the challenge of trying to identify performance with the others uh, metrics is one of trying to neutralize all of those things and having that kind of clean output. But uh, if you sort of just generally think about what has happened in the last year, um, you know, if you think about uh, companies that are levered positively versus negatively to transition risk, if you were to assemble a basket of um, companies that are probably some of the most exposed to transition risk um, and regardless of what you had on the long side, whether it was just a pure S&P 500 or if you had um, the uh, company's lever to uh, climate solutions, uh, you would have done really well uh, during this past year. Now, part of this is there's a broader energy challenge, and that's obviously not uh, either neutral in terms of sector or, um, or style, but it is a uh, thematically, you know, this may have been a long-term play, but it would have done really well for you in the short term. That's probably not surprising. What is more surprising is if you were to do that with something more compound, like uh, healthy living, for example, and you were to look for companies that um, are levered to things like fitness or organics or one side, out of more traditional staples, which we think of as um, you know, recession protection on the other side, 
he would have also done well. Uh, and that's perhaps one thing that is maybe a little bit more surprising where sort of a notional grade like that, you would expect that uh, some of those things would have been considered a luxury and a fair market, um, a fair weather uh, luxury, but they seem to be doing really well based on the uh, equity side, for example. But obviously, it's still uh, early innings of all of this. And, uh, things will evolve over time. Um, and I think what would be the one thing I would uh, close this with is to say um, something really significant has happened. I think in 2008, we saw a structural shift in manufacturing employment the structure of manufacturing in the U.S. as a result of the crisis. Um, and you know, manufacturing now is in different parts of the country. It is focused on different things. Uh, it employs a different profile of people and is, um, and is less labor intensive than it was historically. Uh, and large shocks like what just happened have a um, propensity to accelerate history in that way. So one of the real questions that going forward is to think about what are those themes and how will they play out in an environment where if this kind of a distributed working uh, operates for a long time, what does that actually mean for sustainable cities, for real estate, um, for retail, for that matter, and how do we deal with that in a uh, inclusive and sustainable manner? Great, thanks, Erin. Uh, just in, um, get uh, given, I'm seeing lots of questions on the bottom of my screen. So just to ensure we have time, maybe uh, both starting with John and then following with Mary Jane. Uh, do you want, please just add in, in terms of comments, uh, the, maybe around the general theme of how uh, the pandemics affected the role of, of ESG in, in, in uh, investing. Well, I, and I, I was actually, I was looking at the questions too, and I was sort of thinking about kind of scrolling to those, if that's okay, because so many of them are about data. And I think Haroon, you talked a lot of, about that and like, what, what is the effect going to be on ESG data, standardization of data, what do the data tell us? And, 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 and I think just the important thing to keep in mind is crystallizing what is ESG, given what we've talked about, holistically integrating new sources of data and insight into evaluating companies, securities, and building portfolios. I think often there's a conflation of thinking an ESG score is ESG, right? Um, it's like thinking a credit rating is credit. I think the reality is there are lots of sources of data and lots of input, but when it comes to crystallizing a lot of these things, so, you know, one of the questions asked about the linkage between ESG and earnings, a whole host of things, often what people are doing is they're correlating ESG scores from a provider, an MSCI, Sustainalytics, someone like that, with some other variable. And I think the challenge with that is, number one, you know, the, 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 the ESG scores to some degree are only as good as the inputs, right? We're all relying on companies reporting better information. I'll get to that in a second as a direction of travel and an aspiration for what can come out of this moment. Um, two, they're highly diverse. I mean, the, the MIT published a great paper called the Aggregate Confusion Project and found like a 0.6 correlation between ESG scores. And so trying to, to, to sort of, you know, regress ESG scores to lots of other things and, and think that that gives us an answer, I, I think is a little bit of a challenged, misleading path. And so I, I think it's just, there are a lot of assumptions almost in the questions I would pull back on. Now, what do we do instead? I mean, at the end of the day, we're in a, we're in a data adolescence. It's awkward, it's gangly, and it's frustrating, right? Um, and, and, and I think companies feel like they're asked for too many different things by too many different people. I talked to the CFO of a company recently who said she'd been asked for 2,000 different data points in the last 12 months. Um, you know, asset owners and asset managers are just trying to get real insight to help feed their process, whether it's a quantitative process or a fundamental process like MJ and her colleagues do. Um, and everyone's frustrated. And at the end of the day, what we need is a world where we get better data on fewer things that matter more reported by companies. Right? At the end of the day, that's better for companies that can focus on their core business and using material metrics that are actually relevant to their business performance. Investors get a lot more signal and a lot less noise. So it's better for all the participants and it's better for the health of markets. And I think one of the questions is, can this moment, when we both have hopefully a sounder footing for ESG, it's gone through its stress test, right? but people don't have a lot of time can we channel that appreciation for the importance, but a, a constructive impatience to accelerate that path out of our data adolescence 
it's that world of better data, fewer things that matter more. And that's, you know, top of mind, we had the SASB investor advisory quarterly call this morning. So it's particularly top of mind mm -hmm. right now. But, but I think back to kind of a lot of the questions in there were on how is this correlated to that? I generally am slightly nervous about relying too much on a single data source or a single score as defining ESG. They're all inputs. They can all be useful. But to say that gives us the answer of how ESG relates to X, I think there's a certain challenge in that supposition. And then where is it going and where do I hope it goes? I hope we get to better company reported data on material factors that can fuel all the work that we do. Thanks, John. Uh, Mary Jane, do you want to add uh, to what John was saying or, or perhaps focus on examples of how uh, the, uh, what's happened in the last few months has affected the way people look at uh, ESG investing? Um, maybe, maybe I'll, I'll talk about COVID for, uh, the pandemic for a moment, just because, um, I think, I, I, I hope, I, I don't want to forget to talk about it later, because there's right. so many dynamic questions coming through, which are all great questions. Um, so, you know, I'm thinking about, many of us have talked about this, uh, with the pandemic, this, um, Q1, uh, from February through end of March as like the high, a, a big example of heightened volatility in the market. Um, that when we think back to the financial crisis of 07, 08, um, people are saying, oh, is this kind of like back then when, you know, everything had uh, been compressed, depressed, um, liquidity was gone, uh, you know, there were a lot of people struggling, unemployment, and so on and so forth. Well, the good thing is that this time around, this is, you know, a little different than the financial crisis, is that um, for the pandemic, many companies, uh, individuals, enterprises, uh, were in a better financial state than they were um, back then. Uh, they've, you know, built up their balance sheets. They have very good liquidity and very low lower debt uh, to equity uh, generally for the companies that we looked at. Um, and that companies are in a starting out in a better financial position, and that um, the government has responded very quickly and rapidly with many tools to try to be faster and more aggressive than they were in the previous financial crisis of 07, 08. And so one of the things that we found with ESG is it helps us, you know, continue our engagement. So our CIO told our analysts uh, all throughout Q1, contact all your companies and, you know, check in on how and what they're doing around the pandemic and get an assessment of where they are and then some outlook if you can. And what we're able to see is um, what came, came through the engagements was that there are many companies uh, who are doing things very well within their industry and other companies maybe not as applaudable or laudable as, as they could be. So we're basically asking our companies, um, how do you view your stakeholders? You know, after we talked about what they were doing in terms of capital uh, allocation, what are you doing in terms of stakeholders? And the stakeholders we define to them would be uh, their employees, their communities, their customers, uh, as well as management teams as, and shareholders too. And um, just to give you some very quick examples, we'll take like one company that was a major um, home improvement retailer. They chose immediately to shut down and reduce hours um, for their associates because they didn't want them to be exposed to this you know, growing crisis that people still trying to figure out back in February. Um, their number one competitor chose to reduce hours and shut down two weeks later than they did. So on the one hand, the company that, that we own that was the faster to shut down and try to focus on their associates, um, you know, and fully committed to any medical leave that they needed and continued to pay them um, as, as normal without furloughing them. Uh, they, they have a bit, they had a bit of a hit in their um, quarter, most recent quarter. But we as investors, having spoken to them and understanding the high quality of management and vision that the company had, were okay that they were taking that hit to support their associates. Um, and relative to their peer, we noticed that that peer didn't have to take that hit, but there were probably going to be uh, some sort of trade-off down the road that, that we were thinking about. Um, we looked at some airline companies. We don't own any right now. I, I don't own any, but uh, was the, the CEO of one airline company said, okay, in terms of a stakeholder for management, he said, okay, we're going to cut, I'm going to cut all my pay for the rest of the year because I want to keep as much cash at the firm to pay our employees 
and to help anyone who needs help um, in the workforce. And then the CEO of another airline company said, well, I'll take a 10% cut until June of the salary. So you could just kind of see the contrast, a contrast between one company's action and leadership step and another company's. And it's not a judgment to say who's a good person or a bad person. But for us to analyze these companies and how they're behaving during this time of stress and crisis is interesting to us because we're very focused on the long term. And I think that that's what, I think that's why a lot of investors are attracted to ESG post the financial crisis now through the pandemic is because there's such a long term focus. And so we want to look for those companies that are positioned for the recovery that are doing the right thing now so that when things turn around, we had another company we engaged. And they said, we are committed to not letting go one single employee. Whatever it takes, we're not going to let go of anyone, whether it's management compensation cuts or streamlining, finding efficiencies other places. We don't want to cut anyone. And prudently, they realized that post-financial crisis, they, amongst other companies, were just letting go, trying to cut costs, letting go of um, staff. But when the recovery came around after that, and you know we're in like an 11-year bull market after that, they had a very hard time and they were lagging and trying to get back in shape because they couldn't find um, experienced workers to rehire because it just took a while to do that. So this time they are thinking the recovery will eventually come, but in the meantime, they don't want to let go of anyone because they value their workforce and it's too hard for them to try to recover them. Then we also looked at companies that were doing some innovative things like, um, in our view, uh, providing extra mental health benefits, meaning that this is a really stressful time. Not only do you um, need to worry about your job, but just your health and your life. And so by stepping up and saying, we want you to have health, mental health benefits in addition to anything else, please take that time to make sure you're feeling okay. Um, and then also most of the companies we spoke to were doing a lot of work in making sure their employees are safe. So for companies that are deemed as essential businesses, certain manufacturing plants, uh, certain industries, um, food and other areas, they, they were asked to, they said they, they did all they could to try to make sure their employees were kept safe. And you've seen examples where some uh, companies had workers protest and step forward and said, you know, we're not happy the way that you're making us feel unsafe and forcing us to go to work. Where we had other companies we were talking to where they said, you know, our safety of our employees is a priority, and even if it means lower production or slower turnaround in terms of deliveries, it's what we have to do. So those are just some examples of what we observed through our engagement, talking to our companies, and how companies can react differently, and also gave us some insight on how companies are thinking longer term. Thanks, Mary Jane. Uh, I, I think actually I can see the questions now, so I'll go through a few more. Uh, the um, next one in terms of priority. Uh, of likes. Uh, in terms of resilience, seems like uh, the, that, which I guess must mean the, the reaction to the virus, uh, may weigh heavier now. Um, what kinds of ESG categories align with being more resilient uh, to these types of disruptions? Anyone want to take a crack at that? So I think uh, one of the being at one of those firms that uh, early on in the process was uh, very public about saying that we will keep all of our employees uh, uh, employed for the rest of the year. Uh, I can tell you that uh, the way that you treat your uh, stakeholders, starting with the uh, the employees, probably has quite a bit of a impact on that. So those uh, underlying social metrics, what is the, under, what is the culture of the firm? Uh, some of the work that our institute has done historically on the anatomy of the corporation and uh, breaking up those metrics to try and understand what is it actually that drives the way that a company treats its stakeholders. Um, a lot of those metrics are tremendously useful. Uh, understanding what's the turnover, particularly for um, in uh, sectors that are uh, high, uh, represent a high share of knowledge workers, um, having uh, a healthy corporate culture and healthy, uh, uh, which you can measure in different ways. 
how do people talk about you uh, in social media? Uh, how much turnover do you have? Uh, what kind of benefits do you provide uh, your employees? And I think uh, Mary Jane talked about that. You know, part of it, we were talking a little bit earlier about data, the question of identifying that at a, um, um, in a bulk manner uh, is a challenge. Uh, there's obviously always going to be use for um, an analyst doing the sleuthing of their own. You know, there are probably certain things that we will want to standardize across everybody, but understanding that ad, understanding the, uh, what is critical in a given sector or a subsector or for a particular location, uh, I think there will be, uh, there will always be room for that. But, you know, in general, uh, for that kind of social resilience, at least in the, um, the high knowledge industry, uh, looking at uh, corporate culture and looking at how uh, the corporate entity treats stakeholders, I think is quite, um, quite important. Okay. Okay. Let me get, let, run to the next question so we can get a diverse question set. Uh, in the short term, ESG funds, this is the question, the questioner's view, uh, ESG funds have outperformed in part due to the absence of oil gas sectors. As a recovery begins, do you believe ESG will continue to outperform? Yeah, I, 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 oh, go ahead, go ahead, MJ. No, no, I, um, I was just gonna quickly say that, uh, yes, like if we go back to, I think, both um, Haroon and John were saying this as well, is that we all believe the ESG is about long-term investing. So we're going to have periods where, um, you know, the market outperforms and ESG may or may not also outperform, meaning uh, they will out outperform differently, perhaps uh, they over outperform. Not making sense there for a moment. Um, and then we have periods where there are um, going to be crisis and, and economic recovery is needed. And so I think, you know, oil and gas is, clearly one that a lot of people point to, um, the lack of energy in ESG portfolios. I noticed in looking at other ESG funds around the world that it doesn't seem like that's an automatic remit for all ESG funds. I've noticed that there are a lot of funds that do own oil and gas, and so um, they've taken the good and the bad in owning that, and hopefully they can go back to stock selection if they were to outperform, which is what we believe. Um, and as far as recovering when when the recovery happens we if we're investing again going back to the fundamentals and looking for companies that we think have you know stable businesses franchises recurring revenues good cash flow generation great management team treat their treats their workers well know their customer base increasing innovation so on and so forth um we we don't see why we couldn't continue to uh, perform well in terms of ESG portfolios. How much better can vary on um, different by different industries. So we've seen some industries who are kind of taking a pause right now, and they were forced to because of the shutdown. So their industries, they would travel or um, you know, just take travel, for example. They took this time to actually you know, further examine internally where they can find more efficiency, improve their process, maybe thinking about other marketing plans, where instead of taking this time and saying, okay, we're just going to like wait it out and, and we're going to have to suffer, let's take this time to reassess and clean the house so that when the recovery comes around, we can, you know, be ready to go. And um, I think I'm going to pause that just in the interest of time to John. John? Um, mm -hmm. I, I was I was gonna you know chime in on I think I saw a sub question of our our you know are are any oil and gas companies you know thinking about this on their their path to to energy transition and just you know I I think look you've seen some ongoing announcements you know from energy companies on, on that question I certainly would say our conversations have have shown folks in some cases leaning into this and you know just last week and you can find the the the, the video of this online if you guys want. You know, our CEO interviewed the CEO of BP, British Petroleum, who talked about you know really doubling down on some of their energy transition plans, um, and and so I think look moments of change and disruption um, can slow or accelerate transition, and we certainly see some people thinking about being on the front foot uh, in, in in this moment. Okay, all right. Let me get to another question. Um, 
It says uh, starting in 2018, uh, there was a big surge in consumer sentiment and consumer product companies, I believe is what he firms, consumer product firms commitment to sustainable packaging. Uh, in the midst of COVID, uh, struggling F and B companies seem to put ESG in the back burner. Do you think this phenomenon is only temporary? Can you give some color on disparity between mature and emerging markets? And he gives Brazil as an example, as one that's been severely hit by the pandemic. Yeah, look, I, I think it's a it's it's a great question, and I think we've been spending time. Actually, we had a call with our team earlier. You know, part of what we do is we have the core areas we research. So we have inclusive growth and climate transition. We have nine sub themes under each of those. One of those is waste and material, which gets this it gets into circular economy. And I think you know we've checked in on renewables and the energy complex and a lot of that. It's had some 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 modest hiccups as anything that involves people going and installing things or getting financing have, but broadly continues to to grow. Some of the inclusive growth themes are actually accelerating with virtualization of things like education, health, and financial inclusion. Um, this area you're mentioning is one of the areas we're looking at really closely because that this has added complexity to that, right? Down to the simple fact that I, I you know I I can't get my re refillable coffee cup used. I can't get my refillable tins filled with ground coffee you know, a whole host of, of efforts. Um, and there is a question of, will this slow down? So actually, I, I, we don't have an answer on this yet. I think we're actually checking in a little more structurally uh, with our corporate clients who are focused on this. Uh, and none of them are pulling back on their commitments, um, but I think they're figuring out how to adapt in this moment uh, to keep the same long-term trajectory. But, but, but without a doubt, I think this moment has more significant effects on some of the, the, the circular economy and, and you know, recycling and packaging elements than some of the other subsectors. Okay. Okay, let me, uh, uh, Mary Jane, go ahead. Sorry, I was just gonna quickly add um, on this question. Uh, I, you know, we've seen our, many of our companies continue to be committed to reducing their packaging and on finding some sustainable options um, in F and B. Uh, but one um, company that we recently added to the portfolio because we are, you know, A, trying to get into less cyclical and more secular, more defensive companies, and we uh, chose to add a, an aluminum packaging um, manufacturer. And the thinking around this is that this was to take a shift away from the use of plastic or single-use plastic. Plastic in itself is not necessarily always bad because you, you have, like, plastic that could, can be used for, like, decades but it's the single use plastic that's the problem and that's what gets discarded. And unfortunately the recycling rates around single use plastic, particularly for um, food and beverage containers is pretty low to moderate that you have to have economic value and incentive. And then after China um, stopped taking the recycling for the United States that caused a big glut and an issue of what to do with this plastic waste. And while luminous packaging is not perfect, it's, this um, infinitely recyclable, it has a much higher um, recycled rate, meaning that because it has higher value and it's easier to recycle, we've seen countries around the world, including Brazil and other emerging markets, much more likely to recycle a can than a plastic bottle. And so it contributes to the idea of, you know, people will want to actually collect those cans in the households or outside and recycle and take and removed it from, you know, oceans and lakes and, and landfills. So I think there are some ways that companies are still getting involved. Um, they're shifting in their materials. Um, and, and I think this is something that we've recognized as being an important part for F and B. Okay. I'm going to just take one, uh, one more last question. Unfortunately, I'm sorry. I apologize that we don't have time uh, to, uh, to do more. Um, can you please talk about any studies on the correlation and causation between ESG and company fundamentals? And then he, she, he or she puts in parentheses and hence stock performance. I mean, uh, so I would start with the caveat of, you know, there is no magic singular definition of ESG. And so correlating it, I, I think, has some, some, some challenges. Um, and so I would have the caveats there because there are lots of studies people have done, um, but but I think there there it's just one sort of thing I would keep in mind in looking at those. I think one one source that's been interesting is you know Just Capital, 
um, has also done some interesting publication, kind of looking at what makes in the view of, of the public a good company, and then what are the best data sources that show you the actual performance attributes of, of that goodness. Um, and, then, and then they've looked at that relative to growth rates, relative to ROE, relative to some metrics. So I, I, I'd, I'd go check out their website for some information on that. But I think all the stuff around is ESG correlated with X? You know, ultimately, if you're correlating A to B, you got to have two kind of firm anchors of what your A is and what your B is. And I, I think that some of the, the challenge of having a singular definition of the A of ESG, I think is just something to keep in mind and going through. There's a growing literature that's seeking to do that. Um, but I think it's just something to keep in mind as you parse it. Okay. Thank you, John. Anyone else? Uh, I would um, just add very quick. Oh, sorry, Horan. No, go ahead, Horan. I was just going to add very quickly that um, we did an internal study recently to ask that question to ourselves because, as I mentioned earlier, our analysts assign an internal ESG rating um, to their risk reward for every stock. So we had a population of 800 or so stocks that we own at the company, and uh, we ran an analysis, our performance analytics team did, uh, looking over the past five years through Q1 to say, um, so the stocks that have a higher ESG rating how they perform compared to the stocks below or ESG rating, and overall, how did the stock can perform relative to the broader market for their individual benchmarks? If it's a large cap core to the S&P 500, or if it's an all cap to the Russell 3000, or a global to MSCI, Acqui. Um, and what we found, and again, I would completely agree with John, and I'm sure Haroon would say this too, there are so many caveats and disclaimers and disclosures whenever you're thinking about performance and trying to make a correlation that you have to be very careful. But I would say in our own little study that we did internally, what we found is that AAA is the best in terms of ESG rating, AA is second, single A is third, and then B is kind of like there's a flag or a potential risk. So only four categories. Over the five-year period, which has predominantly been a bull market, the AAA outperformed by quite a bit the lowest ranking, which is the B. So it, it kind of matched our thinking that companies with a higher ESG rating could perform better. But then we also wanted to see what happens during the downturn. So from February 19th through March 31st, which is, you know, in, in the heat of in the intensity of the volatility, we wanted to see, and the ratings uh, matched up again. The AAA ratings outperformed during that very difficult period in the market to our lower rating and also outperformed to their benchmark. So very, very short internal study, but I think it helps managers like ourselves and others as well as, you know, John's team and Haroon's team, like, are we doing this for a purpose um, just to feel good? Or do we also want to, you know, do well in terms of investment performance? Haroon, any parting remarks? Yeah, I think I, what I'd say is uh, there's obviously uh, putting said so far stands. There is a large and growing literature um, on this and people are trying to cut it in lots of different ways. Um, I think some recent work, probably uh, Professor Seraphim up at Harvard, uh, Dr. Hafner out in Dublin. Uh, uh, there was a piece from Engel uh, last year, some work that uh, colleagues out at AQR did uh, are pretty statistically robust and thorough ways of uh, diving into this question because I think a lot of the people are struggling with the same problem. Um, in general, but the this fundamental issue, kind of going back to my original comments, that ESG investing follows a lot of different archetypes, and trying to do that proper statistical matching of who exactly should you be compared to is would be a really hard thing, even if we were dealing with a stationary. Uh, phenomenon and both finance and ESG are extremely non-stationary um, in this cell. So it's a very, very hard thing to do. Um, All right. Well, uh, we are right over a minute past our time here, but uh, I wanted to sneak in the last question. I, I just want to give my sincere thanks to the panelists, uh, Haroon, Mary Jane, and John. You made my job very easy. Uh, to the attendees. I hope you found this worthwhile. I'm sure we could have gone longer, um, but and maybe we can convince the panelists to come back for a, for a part two, part two. But thank you all very much. Have a, have a good day. Bye-bye.